this morning. Is it okay if I ask you some questions to start with? I'd like to ask, in life, what is the first question? What is the question throughout life? And what is the final question? In Thai, the word banha can be translated both question and problem. So, what is the first problem? What is the problem throughout life? And what is the final problem? If anybody has a response, the microphone is available. Seriously, if anybody would like to say anything, the microphone is waiting. For all three, happiness. It's always seemed to me that the question is, what is the question? Because once we have that question, we'll have the answer. And that's something that I've sat with for a long time. Um, Gertrude Stein, on her deathbed, said she didn't know the answer, but she might be getting somehow closer to the question. Um, as for your question, I would like to uh, answer this way. First, what is to, what is to cut? Second, what is the end of the two cut? And the last, how do we go to the end of the two paths? Thank you. Ajahn Buddhadasa suggests that for the third one, if the first question is what is dukkha, and second, what is the end of dukkha, the third, the final question ought to be, if one ends dukkha, what will one get from it? Is it worth it? Is it? Beneficial. Somebody else? <laughs> I saw a few. Well, I have watched a baby being born and I have watched a person dying. And in both cases, the first issue was the first breath and the last issue was the last breath. He's saying, what kind of a problem is that? Or what question is that? I, I think the first problem is uh, one of uncertainty in life, not knowing what to do. Uh, if there is a problem, that is the major problem in life. Uh, the problem, the first question was uh, problems now. Uh, uh, the first, the first problem, as I see it, in life, uh, given that there is a problem is uh, a question of uncertainty uh, about uh, opportunities which come, about the way to react to opportunities, uh, about not knowing uh, from the inside. Uh, that is what I see as a problem of the moment, uh, if there is a problem. Did you, how about the second one? I, I forgot the second question. What is the problem throughout life? Um, again, if I am to make a problem out, out of throughout life, I would say the problem throughout life is uh, uh, to be uh, uncertain. Uh, uh, uncertainty is what I regard to be the chief problem in, in the human disorder. <laughs> but you don't have to make problems. <laughs> I don't have to. No. I'm answering questions. Um, to answer the question of a problem rather than a question, the first problem in life is me. It continues being a problem. The problem now, I'm embarrassed, me has appeared. And when me disappears, problems will disappear. It seems that most of you haven't thought very much 
or maybe have never thought about these questions before. For us, it's these are quite important yet simple questions. We would suggest that the first question is the first question is once we are born, we ought to be asking why were we born? Which means not what causes in the past, but for what purpose are we born? The second question seems to us that we should be asking throughout life is, here we are born in this world, what are we going to do about it? Here we are born into as living human beings, what should we be doing? And the third question is, what should we get from life? What is the benefit or the, what are we going to get out of life? So we, we ask that you ask yourselves these questions continuously. For what purpose were we born? Now that we're born, what are we going to do about it? And what are we going to get from this life, from being born into this life. We, if you consider and reflect upon these questions continuously, then you will be covering all the questions of life. For the course, first question, we can say we are born in order to learn. We are born ignorant. Ignorant just means we don't know. Pali word is avicca, which means not knowing. It's not a negative word as some people take it to be. It just means we don't know. And so we are born in order to learn, in order to replace ignorance with correct understanding. For the second question, what are we going to do throughout life? Buddhists would answer that the thing to do is to kill ignorance, to destroy ignorance, to get rid of ignorance so that it no longer runs our lives. This is what we ought to be working on throughout life, to get rid of, to destroy ignorance. We'd like to mention something special. Um, Have you ever seen a picture of Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu, some Thai it's pronounced, he's pronounced Lao Tzu, no. sometimes in, heard it, Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, the person supposedly who wrote the Tao Te Ching. Have you ever seen a picture of him? Has anybody mm-hmm. seen a picture? <laughs> in, when we first saw a picture of Lao Tzu, He's riding on a water buffalo. He's riding a water buffalo, a very black water buffalo. And in Thailand, and probably most countries where there are water buffaloes, are the beast of burden. They're considered to be very stupid animals. The buffalo, water buffalo is then a symbol of ignorance. So we thought this is a great picture. There is Lao Tzu riding the water buffalo of ignorance. The buffalo is totally under control. And so now, can you ride the buffalo? Do any of you know how to ride a water buffalo? Mm -hmm. Or do you keep falling off? If you can't ride the buffalo, then the water buffalo will ride you. That's how it works. (laughs) If, If you can't ride it, then the water buffalo will drive you. All the time in life you must try to ride the water buffalo, to be in charge and not let the water buffalo ride you. So as you travel around the world, find a way to ride the water buffalo. So we practice anapanasati, this kind of anapanasati meditation in order to learn to ride the water buffalo. So the 
meditation center is a school, is a water buffalo riding school. When you ride home to your friends, you can tell them you've been going to school to learn how to ride water buffaloes. The last question is that, the answer to the last one for us is that when we can, when you can ride the water buffalo, then all problems disappear. The, this is the last problem or question that all problems and questions end when we can ride the water buffalo. In the spiritual theater, just a little ways over there, there are some copies of the Zen ox herding pictures. There are, in the original version of these pictures, a young man is catching an ox or a water buffalo, and then he's able to ride it without any hands playing a flute. But in the final picture, the boy or the young man in the buffalo have disappeared, and there is only voidness. There is just voidness, pure freedom, in which the buffalo and the young man have disappeared. The first picture, if you go look at this series, maybe tomorrow sometime, the first picture, there's just a young man looking around. He's out in nature, out in the woods, in the fields, and he's looking around. In the second picture, he sees the footprints of the, the water buffalo, and then he begins to follow them. And then in the next picture, point sticking out from behind a clump of grass, he sees the rear end of the water buffalo. And then he's chasing after it, and he gets out his rope, and he manages to get the rope around the buffalo's neck. And then there's a big battle, just as many of you are going through in meditation, where there's the rope of mindfulness is on the water buffalo, but it's a tremendous struggle. Finally, he manages to tame the water buffalo enough that he can ride on its back, but he still has to hold the rope very tightly. But then, after a while, the water buffalo loses, becomes even calmer, and it's no longer to hold the rope. The water buffalo will just follow the young man's wishes, and so he can sit on the, the back playing a flute very naturally. And then in the final picture, both of them disappear. There's no water buffalo, there's no young man. There's just voidness, perfect freedom, perfect peace, total voidness. The original set of pictures goes like that, but later they were another version was made that follows the same sequence, but after the voidness, the, there is the young man is now an old sage, and he wanders through the towns or the marketplaces holding a lamp. After having learned to ride the water buffalo, to the point where both the buffalo and the, the man disappear. Then he is able to travel throughout the world, shining a light for the world to, to see. To struggle with the water buffalo can be very dangerous. So one has to have wisdom if one fights the water buffalo foolishly, then with just a flick of its head, it can catch you on its horn and you're dead. So to struggle with the water buffalo, one needs wisdom or insight. 
and for insight there must be samadhi, the mind must be clear, stable and thoroughly alert. It begins, however, with mindfulness. One starts with mindfulness to start to look for the buffalo until one is able to keep one's eyes on the buffalo. And then one can get the rope around the buffalo's neck until one can ride the buffalo. To get the rope around its neck takes samadhi, the mind that is clean, stable, and active. And then to ride it takes wisdom. When there is samadhi, then insight arises. One starts to see things as they are. And through this insight, one is able to ride the buffalo's back. And then one, until the buffalo in the, and we disappear. And then in the end, all there is to do is to travel around the world, um, spreading happiness. Just go around spreading happiness because one has already tamed the buffalo. To train a water buffalo or a wild steer, one needs a stake. One pounds a very firm stake or pole into the ground in order to tie the buffalo down. You have to, if you use too short a rope, it won't work, but one has to have something to tie it down. And then you give it enough rope to work with. And then one begins to study the buffalo, the animal. And through studying it, one comes to understand it more and more and is able to calm it down until one understands it thoroughly. And then it's, one can train it in to do whatever we need it to do, to ride it, to, to pull our carts, to plow the fields, whatever work needs to be done, we, we train the, the buffalo accordingly. In the similar way, when we practice anapanasati, we, we use the breathing as the stake and tie the buffalo to the stake with mindfulness. And then we calm it and study it, calm it and study it, until we can train it, until there is more and more insight, more and more vipassana, and we can train it to do whatever needs to be done. The word yoga, the word yoga, which many of you can have heard, literally means to tie, to tie. And so yoga properly isn't a bunch of bending postures or anything with the body, but the real meaning of yoga is to, to tie down the buffalo and then to train it until it's thoroughly under our control. But here, our doesn't mean the ego or the self. It means thoroughly under the control of, of wisdom. So the rope is like mindfulness, obviously. If the rope breaks, the buffalo runs away. So when you've been practicing meditation, how many times has the rope broken? How many times have you let the buffalo run away? How many, over and over again, how many times has this, this happened where we let the rope break or where the, or maybe just the, the buffalo is so out of control that it breaks the rope and we let it get away. So if we, we practice until the rope doesn't break anymore, once we can keep the rope on the buffalo, then we can really begin to train it. 
until it is calm and we understand it thoroughly. And then when the water buffalo is thoroughly under our control, the kind of natural control where you, you don't need the rope anymore, or where the rope, you don't have to use any force anymore, then we've gotten, we've accomplished what needs to be accomplished and achieved or received the best thing in life, which you can call grace, the, the word very popular among Christians, the, the grace of God. One has received this grace when the water buffalo is totally at your control without having to use any force. If you aren't yet successful in training your buffalo, then continue training it when you get home or as you travel. If you can't train it here, keep working on it until eventually you've at least got the rope around its neck and then slowly it will get calmer and you'll understand it more and more. So keep, keep trying, keep working at it. You came here as tourists and now you'll leave as pilgrims um, taking very, very good care and raising your buffalo with more and more wisdom. This life is the water buffalo. My questions are finished. Do you have any? Um, if anybody has one that w they'd like to ask now, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll read the written ones. How, how does one uh, keep from thinking so much and dwelling on the past so much when one is trying to uh, meditate and still get some insight? Well, that means you, you're not very good at training the buffalo. Um, every, when you start thinking about the past, that means the rope broke the, and you let the buffalo run away. So you've got to find a better rope. Got to get a good rope that won't break so easily or won't break at all. But your rope isn't any good, so go buy a better one. Now, you can't go and buy mindfulness in a store, so you have to just keep looking in yourself until you really got mindfulness. Most of us still have a very incomplete or shaky understanding of mindfulness. So keep working at being aware of the breathing. Keep learning to pay attention to the breathing until there's real mindfulness, until you've developed good mindfulness. When you learned how to ride a bicycle, how many times did you fall off? You didn't ever fall off at all? And every time you fell off, it taught you. Falling off taught you. There wasn't some teacher who taught you how to ride the bicycle. It was falling off that taught you. There's, don't overlook this, don't think that it, you just fall off and that's all, but every falling off teaches us. We'd also like to ask you, can you, do you know how to row a boat? Or, actually, it's more like paddling a canoe. How, how days did it take you to be able to paddle it so you could go straight to where you wanted to go without any... Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Then to just keep repeating it over and over again, practicing until we've got it so it's totally natural and fluent. That's, that's all we can do, whether it's a bicycle or a canoe or mindfulness with breathing. Can you ride a, a bicycle without using your hands? And how, <laughs> how much more time did it learn how to do that? To ride without any hands. Please make use of the, this, this message here that just each time do it some more, do it again, do it again, do it over and over again and get a little better each time. If you fall off, learn from the falling off, get back on and work at it some more. Don't sit there and cry that you fell off. 
or expect somebody else to put you back on. Just keep trying until you stop falling off. So please remember that the activity teaches us. The activity, the action, our own action teaches us, especially our mistakes. The thing that teaches us the best is when we make a mistake. That's, and then we learn how to stop making the mistake. Until you learn it, you keep making the mistake over and over again. But our activity will, will teach us how to not make the mistakes and we'll become more and more skillful. So this time we, our breathing isn't successful, so we breathe like this or we breathe like that. We research the breathing until we find the, the right way to do it. I'll start reading these, but anybody who wants to ask a question, just come up to the microphone. Is anapanasati, is anapana enough? Let me say, the use of the word anapana is incorrect, because without the sati, it's worthless. Anapana is just breathing, so it needs to be anapanasati, um, mindfulness with breathing. Is anapanasati enough? Some Buddhists say that anapana, anapana is good for common concentration but not for insight. Say, they say that only through vipassana is it possible to see things as they really are. Is breathing a way of developing vipassana? The question is a little bit confused. First of all, to use the word anapana is not correct. Um, anapana just means breathing. And of course, if you're just breathing, I mean, you've been doing that since the day you were born, and you'll continue doing it till the day you die. To, the proper name for it is anapanasati. There's the breathing and mindfulness with the breathing. If it's just breathing, it's no big deal. You're not going to learn anything new. There needs to be mindfulness with the breathing. So it's important. Ana means breathing in. Pana means to breathe out. So it's mindfulness with breathing in and out. Please don't forget the mindfulness. As soon as you leave off the mindfulness, you're totally lost. Now, also have to be careful how we interpret this mindfulness with breathing in and out. Some people have a very narrow interpretation that it's just mindfulness of breathing, that you're just obsessed with the breathing. But the, if you examine the way the Buddha taught it, it should be translated mindfulness with breathing. Because one, one is mindful of some reality of nature while breathing in and breathing out. If you examine the Buddha's teaching on this, at first your mindfulness of, you're mindful of things directly associated with the breathing. But as it's been taught to you here, you should, you should understand by now that there's also mindfulness of the feelings, mindfulness of the mind, and most of all, mindfulness of dhammas. So it's not just mindfulness of the breathing, but mind, with the breathing one is mindful of these different things. And if the object of our mindfulness and in investigation changes, and there are altogether 16 objects of mindfulness, 16 truths of nature, that we are mindful of. Now the last, the last group of these, those concerned with Dhamma, these are purely Vipassana. Mindfulness with breathing as the Buddha taught it, the, the, the fourth area which is Dhamma is what is totally Vipassana. Pure vipassana. The other areas with the body, the feelings, in the mind, there are. That's not. 
pure vipassana, but in fact there will be lots of little insights, just insight into the way the breathing works, an insight into how to calm the breathing. Those are those are genuine insights, but it's they're little ones that you don't quite they don't they don't really stand out. You may not notice them. So. If it's just mindfulness of the breathing or mindfulness of the feelings or even just mindfulness of the mind, of states of mind, there will be little insights. But it's only in the final section where there's direct mindfulness of impermanence fading away, the quenching of attachment and tossing back. This is the pure vipassana. You should know that if you are under, if you are aware of and understanding that when the, if we breathe in a long, deep, natural way, that the breathing becomes calm and peaceful, and then the body is calmed and the tension in the body goes away. If you see this for yourself, not thinking about it, but you would see this for yourself. That is considered a kind of vipassana. This is a weak, you can, it's still weak, it's not complete, but this is considered to be some insight. And then through, this is deepened and developed further until it becomes full vipassana in the last stage of practice. When one is mindful of the, the feelings of satisfaction, of rapture, and then you see how these concoct thinking, you see how these, this excited, happy feeling um, stirs up thoughts, that's insight. That's a, that's a little bit of insight, although it's not yet full. If you studied the Pali language, then you would have be able to translate the term anapanasati correctly. If one knows Pali and understands the meaning of this word, you'll recognize that what it means is one is mindful of, one scrutinizes a particular or any truth or fact of nature with every inhalation and every exhalation. This is what the Pali word means. One scrutinizes a, any particular truth or fact of nature with every inhalation and every exhalation. But there's a little difficulty in that in the Dhamma, in the Pali language, the word Dhamma refers to everything. So if you say it means being mindful of everything or anything, and so we need to get a little more specific. If we, if we review Anapanasati from step to step from the very beginning, you'll see that the first, the first lessons are dealing with characteristics, qualities, features of the breathing. It's scrutinizing different qualities and characteristics of the breathing, the longness of the breathing, the shortness of the breathing, the fineness, the calmness of the breathing. This is what is scrutinized in the step-by-step -step in the first lessons. You know now that there are 16 lessons or topics for our study and investigation while breathing in and breathing out. Actually, we could, we could specify far more if we wanted to because we could be much more detailed about them. But to speak of 16 is sufficient without getting too complicated and overly detailed. So there are these 16 different objects for our scrutiny. It's not just being mindful of the breathing. 
there's far more to do than that. This word can even be used for things that have nothing to do with Dhamma. For example, instead of practicing the 16 lessons, you can, you can just spend your time thinking of home. And that would be a kind of, if you do that with every inhalation and every exhalation, then that's a kind of anapanasati also, although it has nothing to do with Dhamma. Even in a harmful and nasty way, one can, if for example you hate somebody and you just sit there thinking about what they've done and why you hate them and on and on, while with every inhalation and every exhalation you're just thinking about how much you hate this person. Although this is quite harmful for you, you can call it a kind of stupid anapanasati. If we speak about the Buddha's anapanasati, then we're talking about the, the 16 lessons of anapanasati which the Buddha taught. Outside of Buddhism, however, there are other forms of anapanasati. Some of them are, are just kind of useless, and there are even forms which are dangerous. Okay, here's a question that is rather common. Actually, there are two of them that are basically the same. What happens to the mind and body when, when one dies? Which means, I guess, when the physical body dies. What is left after death? And a similar question is, does consciousness continue in some form or another? This question doesn't have, is a, on a total, is on a different subject. It's not related to anapanasati. In Buddhism, there is no self. There is no atta to carry on after death. Buddhism doesn't, in Buddhism's observation of life, what there is no self or atta be to be found which would some self or soul that would carry on after death. Now if one practices anapanasati correctly, one is practicing for nibbana or for a synonym of which is nirota. Nirota means to be thoroughly quenched. It's the, the quenching where there is no remainder with nothing left over. So if one practices anapanasati for this remainderless quenching, for this thorough cessation, so you have to be careful what is quenched and not get too many wrong ideas about this. But it, if one practices anapanasati like this steadily up until the point of death, then there is this quenching with nothing remaining. With this, these ideas about dying and then being re reborn or reincarnated somewhere, one has to be very careful about these things because dukkha is our goal is to end dukkha, to quench dukkha. And dukkha is here. And so you've got to quench it, you've got to end the dukkha here. If, if, imagine that if you died and then there was some rebirth somewhere, well then there's just more dukkha. So be very careful about these ideas because the, the problem is dukkha here and now. The problem is not dukkha in the future. No matter how many times you might get reborn, if there's such a thing, there's only one, dukkha is always the same. 
if you're going to end dukkha in Thailand or you're going to end dukkha in America or Europe, the way is the same. There's everywhere there, it's, there's the same way of ending dukkha. Because dukkha is the same everywhere. As for the question of, is there anything left after death? Um, that's the answer. First, we must point out that's not the problem. That's whether something remains or not is not the problem. The problem, once again, is dukkha. It's a very simple matter. The, the things which have been borrowed from nature, such as the six elements, these then are returned to nature. Next question. Do you believe in God or in some form of higher power? When speaking of God or belief in God, this is something important. And we can say, yes, we, I believe in God. In fact, this is necessary. But we, but people need to be very careful about the word because if you cling to the word God people are giving it all kinds of different meanings and in fact if if a Buddhist says I believe in God there are certain Christians who will go and print it in books and use it for propaganda purposes so it's not the word that matters but the meaning and so the meaning of God that w we see is God is the highest thing that we must obey. The highest thing that must be obeyed. If we examine, we'll see that all living things have some highest thing that must be obeyed. And this, no living creature can avoid this. If you want to call it God, you can. But don't get stuck in the sound of the word, in no matter what the language, as some very propagandistic people do. But see the meaning of the word. And there is something that all living things, even a dog, even a dog has its highest thing that it must obey. Now for Christians, and the so-called theistic religions. Actually, everything is theistic, if you understand the word properly, but Christianity has a personal God. God is conceived in personal anthropomorphic terms. And so that's one kind of God. And for Christians, this is the highest thing that must be obeyed. There, it's their understanding of the thing which the highest power that has to be obeyed. Buddhists, however, don't see this thing as being personal or having a personality that gets angry and all that. For Buddhists, the highest thing which must be obeyed is more, is a law and not a person. It's the law of nature, or the truth of nature, which we call itapajayata, the law of conditionality, the fact that all things happen through conditions, through causes and conditions. For Buddhists, this is the thing which must be obeyed, and this is absolute. There's no escaping this law of nature. So let's not cling to words, but understand the meaning of them. And you'll see that all living things, even plants, snails, worms, dogs, all of them have some highest thing that must be obeyed. If, they, if there's, it's not obeyed, there is pain, there is suffering. And so if we speak in this way, everyone must believe in some God. Of course, the question is how one understands God, the one's understanding of this highest thing.
that must be obeyed. But for Buddhists, it's we prefer to call it the law of nature. So let us stress that the meaning of God is the highest thing which must be obeyed. But there are many levels to this, to God. There are many levels depending on the intelligence of, of each person or of each being. For example, for dogs, they have some highest power which must be obeyed, which is us, their owner. For, for a dog, God is their owner. Or for example, children in school, God is the teacher because the teacher has a ruler and if the kids get out of line, they get, they get punished. So in that time and place, the God of the school child is the teacher. And then this, there are other levels. There are people who have money and the thing for them, the most powerful thing for them is money. Money is what they have to obey. This is according to their understanding. And then ideas of God develop until we come to the, the um, conceptions in religions such as Hinduism or Christianity where God is personalized. God is seen as being a person and one must obey that personal God. And then finally there is the, the God of Buddhism which is seen to be not at all personal but totally natural. Not supernatural but natural and is the, the law of nature. All of these levels of God must be obeyed according to the intelligence and understanding of, of each person. In fact, each person has their own God although this may change from time to time. But all have this, this some God. And what's very interesting, uh, an interesting coincidence, is that if you pronounce the word in more long, you pronounce God. But if you shorten it, it's got. And in Thai, the word got means long. God means, Thais pronounce it God. There's God and there's God, which means law. The highest thing that needs to be obeyed. Some people have a husband or wife whom they love very much. Do any of you have this kind of God? If you achieve nirvana, are you breaking the laws of nature? Is it not natural to be greedy, selfish, and these other bukkhas? Um, do you break the law of nature by realizing nirvana? Isn't it natural to be selfish? Is that what you're saying? Um, the word dhamma means nature. And there are four meanings to this word nature. There are four aspects of nature. The first meaning or aspect of nature is all things, everything existing in this world, all the mental and physical things of this world. The second meaning of nature is the law of conditionality which governs all these material and mental things. The third meaning of nature is the duty that needs to be followed according to that law of nature. If there is a law that's governing all these mental and physical things, then all those mental and physical things must harmonize with, must follow that law. And this is called duty. And then the fourth kind of nature is the fruits, the results that come from, from doing that duty. Now of these four meanings of nature, the most important is the third one because that's what we practice. The most important meaning of nature is 
the duty according to natural law. But this is just more nature. This is totally natural that there is a duty to be done. And when the duty is done, the result is coolness, is Nibbana. And when the duty is done perfectly, there is the perfect result of perfect coolness or Nibbana. And this, this is just more nature. So if you study the meaning of the word Dhamma or nature, you'll see that all things are nature, that realizing Nibbana is just part of nature. It has, it doesn't go against nature in any way. You shouldn't be surprised or think it's strange that we say Nibbana is a nature, that you need to understand that nature comes in two basic forms or there are two kinds of nature. One is what in the West is called phenomena. There are phenomena, this is in Pali called sankata, things which are created, which have beginnings and ends, things which are constantly changing. All these phenomena or sankata are one kind of nature. But there is another kind of nature, which unfortunately in the West there aren't, isn't any clear term. We think, however, the, the term numanan might be the closest. This is a translation of the Pali word asankata, which means things which don't change, which aren't created, which don't end, things which aren't born, aren't created, aren't made. These are asankata or unconcocted. There are the concocted things, phenomena, and the unconcocted, the numina, which is, there's only one of these. And it is also nature. So if you understand that there are these two kinds of nature, then you won't be surprised to hear that Nibbana is totally natural. In Buddhism, there is nothing supernatural. We don't have the word supernatural. Everything is nature. Even the law of nature, the law of nature may govern other natures, but that law of nature is still natural. It's still part of nature. There isn't anything which is outside of, be of, or beyond nature. So we don't use the word supernatural. The word supernature or supernatural is for children. But if you understand nature thoroughly and correctly, you won't need this childish idea of supernatural. Um, to, I reminded about your, the part about selfishness and whether selfishness is unnatural or unselfishness is unnatural. And he said, both selfishness and unselfishness are natural. Um, selfishness is natural and it brings on the further, further natural things of pain, suffering, crime, and all kinds of severe ecological problems. Whereas unselfishness is equally natural, but it brings on different natural results, one such as peace and freedom from dukkha. Whether it is wrong, whether being wrong or being right, whether black or white, all of these are natures, all of them are natural. All of the different pairs of opposites, male, female, up and down, all of these are just natures, are natural. Um, if God is uh, the law of nature and there's nothing beyond that, then how did the law of nature come to exist in the first place? In, in Buddhism, we speak of the law of nature as being a sankata, which we just mentioned. It means something that doesn't depend on anything else. So you're implying that the law of nature must be sankata, something that depends on other things, something which is conditioned by other things. 
But for us, the law of nature is asankata. It's unconditioned. It's totally independent. It, it doesn't depend on any other conditions. It exists in itself without depending on any other thing. We speak of the law of nature. We speak of nibbana. We speak of voidness as being a sankata. It, it need not depend on anything, including our thoughts. None of these things depend on us or our thinking or our beliefs or any of that. Um, this is a very difficult thing to understand in Buddhism, this a sankata, which has no causes, which has no conditions. This reality that doesn't depend on anything else but it exists by itself. Although it's very interesting that if we speak very carefully, we say that the asankata is neither existence nor non-existence, but that's even harder to understand. There's a word that expresses this. Um, it's atamayata, and he asked me to explain this. Atamayata means not conditioned by that thing or not dependent on that condition. Sankata, ordinary concocted things which have beginnings and ends which are always changing, these are always dependent on other things. And this is how our minds usually are. Our minds are always depending on thoughts, on feelings, and so on. But there is a reality which we are trying to point to. Sometimes we call it Nibbana, sometimes we call it the law of nature, depending on how we're looking at it. And this is Asankata, it depends on nothing, as we've been explaining. And you, another name for that is Adhammayata, the state or the, the reality, the truth which isn't conditioned by that. The reality which is a means not, dang means that. Maya means made by or formed out of. So da means the, the truth or the reality, the, the nature. So that nature which isn't dependent on anything, isn't conditioned by anything, this is called Atamayat, you can, another word for that is atamayata. Asankata means unconcocted. And there are other words which mean unborn, undying, unchanging, and so on. When the mind, and the mind can realize this reality of asankata, of atamayata, when the mind realizes a dhammayata, we can say the mind has a dhammayata. And when the mind has a dhammayata, the mind is totally free. Then the mind isn't dependent on any thoughts, on any feeling, on any worldly condition. The mind is totally independent. This means it's not grasping at anything. It's not attaching to anything. And this we can call the unconcocted mind, the mind that is totally independent because it, it has realized a dhammayata. Sometimes we call this the paramadhamma. The parama means supreme, that which there is nothing higher or beyond. The Paramadhamma can be translated the supreme thing. This is another name for Nibbana, the supreme thing. There's nothing beyond it, nothing higher than it. So in English you have the words more supreme and most supreme, which is getting carried away. There's only the supreme, the supreme thing. Um, some people have an idea of God, that God, you, you pray to and ask for things from God. But you should understand that a God 
that is depends on human prayers or a god that depends on human worship a god that can be bribed by sacrifices or by offerings or by singing songs or ceremonies or rituals that isn't god that's not the god it might be somebody else's god but it's not the god of buddhism if you use the word god in terms of buddhism it's this thing which is totally independent of all other things of all other natures and so it can't be bribed um it's not affected by our worship by our prayers or anything like that it's independent of anything human beings can do to say that it's not dependent on other thing anything it doesn't rely on anything it's not associated with anything these words are hard to explain this is the true meaning of the word supreme on independent needn't rely on anything unlimited by anything Have you experienced the panama dama? We don't answer personal questions and so we have no answer to such personal questions. As the um space element is the background against which the others are known or exist is nirvana the background against which conditioned phenomena exist could you say that once more as the uh, space element is the element against which the others exist is a background foreground is nirvana the background against which condition phenomena exists the meanings are are different the uh, the agasa datu the space element is void so that other things can um take place or happen this is a very ordinary meaning of voidness um whereas nibbana is totally void um it's it's voidness doesn't relate to other things the way the voidness of the space element relates to the other elements so um for the meaning of nibbana it is to be to be void of defilements when we use the word void we're also it means to be void empty but also free from and so to be void of defilements to be void of dukkha to be free from me and mine to be void of and free from all problems from all burdens this is the meaning for nibbana existing such that there's no need for existence being so there's no where there's no need to be voidness is existing without any existing <laughs> do you understand <laughs> absolutely not all <laughs> sankata things exist in order to exist and then they don't last very long <laughs> but nibbana doesn't need to exist it has its existence is totally different and so it's the absolute thing and it doesn't fall apart walking without the walker is to be void void of defilements void of me and mine void of dukkha void of burdens during meditation one is very much concentrated only on oneself this can be quite selfish if it is done only for the benefit of oneself and not for the benefits of others too looking around there are many beings suffering who need our help urgently 
how can we help others through meditation? Selfishness is due to the power of ignorance. If it isn't ignorance, then you can't call it selfishness. So when it's not ignorance, but instead is through the power of mindfulness and wisdom, then we don't call it selfishness. So one, if one is helping oneself in, in, with ignorance, that is selfish. But if one is truly helping oneself with wisdom, you can't call that selfish. And so when we free ourselves from ignorance, then we can also help to free others from ignorance so that they're no longer selfish. When we can free ourselves, see, if, if it's wise, one frees oneself from selfishness and then one can help others to free themselves from selfishness. Of course, at the beginning, our, when we get started, there's there's some selfishness, there may be a lot of selfishness. But if we practice correctly, there's less and less selfishness. The more correct our Dhamma practice, the less selfishness there is until there's no more selfishness. So at the start, there's a lot of selfishness. And then as we practice more and more correctly, there's less and less selfishness. So Dhamma practice is this transformation from selfishness to unselfishness. Don't expect to be totally unselfish at the beginning, but try to get free from it as quickly as possible. If you came here as a tourist, you came selfishly. But if you leave as a pilgrim, you will have left self behind, and you, as a pilgrim, you will travel <laughs> unselfishly. I would like to ask more about Nipana. Can you say that Nipana is uh, a kind of conflict? Um, the other day we said that there isn't anything which isn't a datu or element. So, of course, Nibbana is a datu, an element also. Um, when we were talking about Asankata, Nibbana is called the Asankata Datu. You can call it the Nibbana Datu. You can call it the Voidness Datu or the Quenching Nirota Datu, which is the Datu which doesn't depend on other Datus, whereas all other Datus are Sankata. They depend on, they're changed by, they're influenced by other Datus. So Nibbana, Nibbana is, in the meaning of element or dhatu in Buddhism, Nibbana is an element because everything is an element. Now this is the Buddhist understanding of the words element or dhatu, so you won't find the Nibbana on the periodic table of elements, for example. But even in the Buddhist understanding of dhatu, there is the element of being and there is the element of not being and there is the element of neither being nor not being. All of these, being is an element, not being is an element and neither being nor not being is an element in Buddhism. Mm. This, this Buddhist meaning of dhatu you won't find it in any of the dictionaries in the world. This is the problem. All the dictionaries leave out the Buddhist um, meanings of words. So people have trouble understanding them. We have to improve our dictionaries a little bit. It's a little strange, isn't it? The existence element, the non-existence element, and the not existing and not not existing element. They don't have these, these, this doesn't appear in the dictionaries you, you use at university. Is all of life suffering or is, does 
is suffering something that just happens occasionally. Right now, I don't feel terribly distressed about anything, and usually I don't. If I was to analyze myself into smaller parts, there are many components and bacteria which could be un undergoing distress right now. <clears throat> so the idea of life being suffering is somewhat paradoxical sometimes because there are times when things don't appear to be in pain. You use the word not terribly stressed, which sounds like there's some stress, there's just not a lot. Are you saying no stress or, or some? En enough for me to recognize it as being, as myself, as being in pain. Right? You don't feel any right now. No, I'm, so I can on, on, a, on a large aggregate level, the way I'm experiencing myself right now, I don't feel suffering. Okay. I, I can find some, I suppose, if I looked hard enough and I was meditating, but, but uh, without a lot of thought and analysis, I just feel okay right now. Okay. Well, he's not asking you to create suffering for yourself. Um, whether, there, whether life is dukkha or not depends on how we hold on, how we hold it, how we use it, how we deal with it. If w there is a way of managing life so there is no dukkha, and there's a way of managing life so that it is dukkha. So we come to study Buddha Dhamma so that we can live life in a way that there's no dukkha. If we hold on to it in a certain way, there for sure will be pain, stress, dukkha. But if we don't, if we hold on it in another way, there's nothing painful or stressful about it. Any life which is still under the influence of positive and negative will suffer will experience pain, but any life which is free of the influence of positive and negative will have no dukkha. So we suggest that you consider this study and practice of Dhamma to be a lifting of lifting life above positive and negative. Take life and lift it above the influence of positive and negative. Any life which must, which still must laugh and must cry is a life where there is suffering. Any life that still must be sad and glad is a life where there is still suffering. To be free, life must be above having to laugh and having to cry the above gladness and sadness. Some people will will say that that doesn't sound like much fun. It doesn't. It's not as exciting as living in the world. Some people think that nibbana is bland, is is tasteless. That for them it isn't any fun. That it can't be the ups and downs of, of worldly existence. Um, of course, everybody can think what they wish, but one should be very careful. Nibbana has no, no booze. Nibbana has no dancing. And so most people aren't interested in Nibbana. If there's no beer in Nibbana, most, most people don't want to go. If, as I think you said, that when you die, consciousness and the elements return to nature, is that, if that's regardless of whether you've attained Nibbana, then 
or not, then for what reason would a person strive very hard to obtain the bhana? If he can strive for material wealth or kill people to get what he wants or she, and then the same thing happens when they die. Do you understand what I mean? Because we're, we were, because we don't want any problems, we don't want these hassles right now, right here. Um, we eliminate attachment, we eliminate the me and mine right now in order to be free right now. We're, it's not something we, that we're waiting for at death. It's not something that one gets at death where the question is right now living free of dukkha. This kind of thinking has happened before. Um, many of you have heard about the Jim Jones in the Temple of God or whatever his sect was called. They, they believed that they were living correctly, that their spiritual practice was, was perfect and that if they died, they would go straight to God. So they figured out, why wait? Why waste time sitting around on this earth when we, if we die, we go straight to God? So then they all drank cyanide, Kool-Aid, and killed themselves. So this kind of thinking has happened before, this idea of, you know, if we die, the problem's over, so why not get it over with? Even the children were encouraged to drink the Kool-Aid. What was it, 300-something people died? Is it uh, absolutely necessary to experience Dukkha in order to realize Nibbana? And if yes, uh, why and to what extent? All of us ought to know Nibbana. In fact, all of us do know it. And we ought to be thankful for Nibbana because it's what makes us wise. So everyone should be thankful for, for Dukkha because it's what Dukkha is what chases us to Nibbana. Basically, you only have to experience dukkha for as long as you're stupid enough to make it. Once one is smart enough to stop creating dukkha, one no longer needs to learn from it. But as long as we haven't learned the lesson, <laughs> then we have to keep spinning around in the dukkha of our own creation. Of course, if there's no interest in ending dukkha, then there's no Nibbana. If there's no Dukkha, then we don't need God to save us from Dukkha. Finally, thank you. So, thanks. <laughs>